Let us get started. I hope everybody's doing well. Um, we are going to be continuing what we started the last week, which was the second chapter of Daniel. Uh, this is the second chapter of Daniel. We're going to the second year of Nebuchadnezzar, right? And um, the date is important. Um, because at this point, Nebuchadnezzar did not yet conquer the land of Israel. And I want to explain to you why the land of Israel is essential to empire building. Because there was always uh, Egypt on the southwest, and then you have Syria, Iraq on the northeast. And those two represented different civilizations, different countries. And there was always these wars where they would go over Israel, fight wars against each other, but nobody was able to unite those two land masses. There was always a war between the north and the south. And Nebuchadnezzar is going to do something that nobody did before. He is going to create an empire. But this is before the empire, okay? But you need to understand that from time immemorial, there was this war going on, and Nebuchadnezzar is aware of that, and he has these plans in his mind, and he begins to have this dream, and the dream repeats itself over and over again in the form of a nightmare. We, we read last week what happens to Nebuchadnezzar at the uh, psychological level. Um, he's tormented by the dream. He wants his uh, interpreters to tell him what it is that he dreamt, not just to interpret the dream, but to, to tell him what the dream was. And when they said, no, we can't do it, Nebuchadnezzar got angry and he says, every intellectual in Babylonia is going to be killed, executed. I've had it with these people, says Nebuchadnezzar. And so they begin to kill people and Daniel tells them to stop. And that's what we got at the end of last week. Daniel tells them to stop, stop the executions. I can tell Nebuchadnezzar the dream. I can tell Nebuchadnezzar the interpretation of the dream. So that was last week. Okay? Now, open up your pages. I just want to make sure that you have the correct um, uh, verses. What's the first question here? Okay, good. So Daniel is brought in front of the king. He is now ready to do what nobody was able to do. And uh, that's where we are now. So, Ane Malka the king sees Daniel in front of him. Daniel's name in, um, in um, Babylonian is called Bel Teshasar. You remember that we studied a few weeks ago how his name was changed from his Hebrew name to uh, an Aramaic name. Can you tell me the dream that I had? Can you tell me the dream and can you then interpret the dream? That's the ask. Daniel replies to the king and he says as follows. Raza, the Malkasha El, the secret that the king is asking for. This is not something that people can on their own know. Astrologers cannot know it. Sorcerers cannot know it. Uh, the Gaizirin, we didn't explain what ga ga Gazerin are. The Gazerin are those involved in augury. Are you familiar with augury? So what they would do is they would take, um, they would take animals and they would sacrifice the animals to the gods and then they would slit them open. Um, and they would look at the entrails of the animal, the, the liver, the heart, and other organs, and they would map out instructions based upon the shape of the entrails. Well, this was common in the ancient world. I mean, you think people are crazy, um, um, uh, you know, but this was just a common practice. It wasn't just in Babylonia. They, the Romans, uh, they used to do this all the time, especially if they were going to war, if they were going to a battle, they would bring in the Gaizirin or the Gazerin, and they would perform these rituals open up the animal, look at the entrails, and they wanted to confirm that the gods are okay with the battle plan, right? So this was part of the um, craziness of the ancient world, which is not to say that we don't have craziness now in the modern world. We do, it's just a different type of craziness. Um, so Daniel is telling um, the king 
He's telling this is something that no human being can ever figure out on his own. Deram. So how do I know it? Itai ela Ishmaya. There is a single God in the heavens. Galeravim. This God knows all the secrets. And this God is giving you a private message. This God is speaking to you through your dream. He wants to reveal something to you. Specifically, He wants to tell you what is going to happen in Acharit HaYamim. Now those of you who know a little biblical Hebrew, Acharit HaYamim refers to the uh, messianic era, right? The era after, you know, the collapse of civilization, right, of Mehmet Gogu Magog, and eventually the establishment of the final kingdom of God. So he says, God knows what you are doing, and he wants you to see how what you are doing is going to lead to a series of events, and what those series of events are, and it's going to lead all the way, all the way to postmodern history, where, let's say, we're, let's say, I don't know when the Mashiach is coming, but whenever that is, this book is telling us how it's going to unfold. So a few things. Number one, Nebuchadnezzar is a powerful uh, tyrant, right? I said eventually he's going to become an emperor, right? Political leaders forget that there is a God, right? That what was the saying? Absolute power corrupts absolutely. Political leaders begin to think that they are actually God. They begin to feel invincible, um, and they think that their thoughts are their own. Nobody can penetrate their mind and see what they're really thinking. So, ha ha, I'm going to trick the people. I have these things that nobody knows. I can get away with murder, and I can paint it in the most gentle fashion because you don't really know what I'm doing. You really don't know what I'm thinking and why I'm doing what I can do anything and say it's okay. They have assisted suicide in Canada. They have these commercials. I saw this commercial, a Canadian commercial, where they were painting assisted suicide in the most beautiful way. You know, what's so, so beautiful? It's an assisted suicide. So you can take any, you know, abomination and just paint it, you know, so if you're the emperor, take anything and just paint it as something beautiful. We have some good uh, music in the background, right? And whatever it is, just put, put the abomination and you're okay. So Hashem is telling Nebuchadnezzar, I know what you're up to. I see what you're thinking. You're not invincible, right? Uh, before you went to sleep, you were thinking about something, and these thoughts generated a particular series of dreams. God knows what you're planning to do, and he wants to tell you how your actions will change human history, because you're thinking about that, and you're concerned about that, so God is now going to answer your question. You're wondering what's going to happen. I will tell you what's going to happen. Number, and, and in addition, Ant Malka Rayonach al Mishkevach Seliku. You, O oh, Your Majesty, you were thinking deeply and you were becoming overpowered by your thoughts. Because you were saying, if I am going to create an empire, will this empire? exist forever. Once I have this tyrannical power, I control people. I have an army. I control other kings. They're beneath me. At this point, I have absolute power. Can this absolute power stay forever? That's what you're thinking. And now, he who reveals secrets is going to tell you the answer to your Question. God is going to let you know what it means to be an emperor. There will be a concatenation of events, and you will not control what takes place after. But Anna, as for me, says Daniel, it is not because I'm smarter than other people, it's not because I'm the most intelligent among your various intellectuals. This is not why God revealed this secret to me. But rather, lahen al divrach di tishra lemalka yehoderun verayone 
It is because God is using me as a messenger to give you the answer to your questions. That's it. That's the introduction. At this point, so my question would be this: that told Paro that whatever God is telling him, that he should not say it's not his own. Uh, <coughs> correct, correct. And 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 there's a lot of similarities between Daniel and, and Yosef. Um, many, many similarities. Um, and maybe in Parashat Miket I'll talk a little about that. But et et Yosef gid leparo. Right. So exactly the same idea. So that's Daniel. He's letting Nebuchadnezzar know. God is looking at his mind, God read his thoughts, God knows his questions, and God is answering his questions directly. I am merely a messenger. And here it is. Ant Malka, Hazeh Habaita, you, O king, you were looking into your dream, you were looking around. Va'alu Selem Hat Sagi, and behold, there was an enormous idol. Salma, the, the idol was huge in size and it was shining with a very bright light. And this idol was approaching you, was standing in front of you, almost opposing you. And as the idol came close to you, the, um, the, line, the, um, uh, the shining was blinding. This idol was composed on the top, the head, from pure gold. The chest and the arms, they were made out of silver. The um, stomach and the upper part of the legs, they were made out of bronze. Shakohi difarzel, the lower part of the legs and the feet, minehen difarzel, part of it was made from iron, uminehen di hasaf, and part of it was made from uh, clay. Hazea vaita, and you begun to look at the idol, and as you were looking at the idol, ad dihik zeret even dilavidain, a stone was somehow carved out of a mountain perhaps, but the stone was carved out, but there was no human hand that touched the stone. And this stone smashed the feet of the idol. Remember we said the feet of the idol were made out of iron and then clay? And the entire idol became pulverized. Pulverized. That's the that's a dream. Okay, and we're going to see the end of the dream in a moment. And finally, the cool chahada. Everything came crashing down. Parzela, the uh, iron, haspa, the uh, clay, nehasha, the um, nehoshet is copper, um, kaspa is silver, but the the whole idol came crashing down. Vahavo, keur, min idnerekai. And all that was left was dust blowing in the wind, like when you have in the summer when you harvest the wheat and then you go to the threshing floor and then you, um, you throw the wheat in the air and the shaft blows away in the wind. So all that was left in the idol was dust blowing in the wind. And the wind just kept blowing and blowing and blowing till there was nothing left. When you looked at the place where the idol was, you didn't see anything. It was gone completely. Right? The Abna di Mehatli Salma, on the other hand, the stone, it was originally just a regular stone that came out of a mountain. It was cut by non human hands. Something cut the stone, but it was not a human being. This stone 
begun to grow. Havat Metura became a huge mountain, Umlat Kolaa, and eventually this mountain was so big that it filled up the entire earth. That's it. That's the dream. This is the dream you have. And now I am going to tell you the meaning of this dream. So we're now going to study the meaning. Now that we, now that we read the, um, the description of the dream, it's the, the, the dream itself is remarkable. And I'm just going to make an introductory remark, a comment, because the, um, what, what you're going to see now in the interpretation of the dream is going to be a description of how history unfolded from the days of Nebuchadnezzar going forward to the various empires all the way through to the Roman Empire, and I would say even past the Roman Empire. And, and, and what happens is that there are many uh, secularists who have a problem with this and they don't know what to do exactly. So some of them try to say that this book was written sometime in the Greek era. And the problem with saying that it was written in the Greek era, well, A, the language is, is from ancient Aramaic as was spoken in the Neo-Babylonian Empire. So it's a little, little difficult to say that it's from the Greek era. But B, there's also very precise descriptions in the book itself that were eyewitness accounts of what the palace of Nebuchadnezzar looked like, right? Uh, specifically the, uh, when it gets down to his grandson, Belshazzar. So it's very difficult to posit, just as a you know, scientific matter. I mean, you know, we're Jewish. We believe in the, in the Torah as, as it's written, so it's not a problem. But their, um, their skepticism about the Tanakh is really uh, negated by the book of Daniel. They don't know what to do with it. And, and even if you say that it was written in the Greek era, well, then there's a description of what happens in the Roman period. So it really is a problematic book. Meaning if you're a secularist Jew, you don't know what to do with this book because it really describes things so precisely and so incredibly. Now you're going to see some of those descriptions that they're, they're, they're you know, they, they, they have to make all these intellectual acrobatics. I'm just making you aware of that, that Daniel is a problematic book. Not for us, for the, uh, for the secularists. All right? So now let us, we're in verse 37. We're now going to start reading the interpretation of You, Nebuchadnezzar, you are not a regular king. You are going to become the king of kings. As I said, he is going to establish an empire, right? And what Nebuchadnezzar is going to do in only a few years, he is going to be the first one who is going to take, because there were various empires, um, you know, the Chinese, the Chinese had their kingdoms, the, the Mongolians had their kingdoms that they controlled the trade routes. But now what Nebuchadnezzar is going to do for the first time, which never happened before, is he controls Mesopotamia. So imagine you have Israel here, the Mediterranean here, right? So you have Israel, and you have Mesopotamia, ancient Babylonia, going to Iran, going eventually to India. So what he's going to do for the first time is he is going to cross into Israel, take over Israel, and then he's going to go past Israel into Egypt, and he's going to control the entire landmass, which will be parts of North, North Africa, Egypt, going down south into Ethiopia, of course, Israel. So he's going to create this empire that nobody else ever created. So he's referred to not as a melech, but melech malchaya. You are going to be an emperor. The Elah Shemaya Malkuta Chisna. God in heaven is going to give you a stable empire. Betokfa. It is going to be a powerful empire. Bikare Yehavla and he's going to give you tremendous glory. Let me explain this. Tyrants oftentimes hate God, right? And not only they hate God, they feel that they are God. But I have a theory. So if I may share it with you, you don't have to accept it. This is a complete theory. I know that the Nazis were obsessed with germs and dirt, and I know there was different tyrants over history who are obsessed with germs and dirt, and now the Chinese... Um, uh, Chinese communists are obsessed with the coronavirus. You know, somebody might have a cold, so they have to lock them in the apartment building and burn them alive, you know, to protect them for their own good. <coughs> so um, now we have a certain uh, mini-revolution take place. I don't know how the revolution will turn out. 
But there is this obsession among tyrants with germs, and I think the reason for that obsession is as follows. Tyrants love to think that they're God, and they have power, they have armies, and they can go and they use guns and paints and bombs, and, and you know, in the ancient times it was Pa'o with his chariots. There's one thing that drives them crazy, germs. They can't fight germs because you can't take a gun and shoot at a germ, and it just drives them crazy. I think the obsession of the tyrant with germs and, 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 and in, this, in this case, coronavirus, it's because they feel that their omnipotence is threatened. What do I do with the germ? I know what to do with Taiwan, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll blockade them, I'll bomb them if I need to do. I know what to do with various types of military situations. What do you do with germs? This is why when Paro, when the germs enter Mitzrayim, Gebet, right? What do they say? Esba Elohimi, this is the finger of God. They don't know what to do, right? So it drives the tyrants crazy. So tyrants have this sense of omnipotence and here's the joke. And this is what Daniel is telling uh, Nebuchadnezzar. You're actually fulfilling a divine mission. You just don't know it. God is the one who's giving you the power. And God is giving you the power because God has a particular objective that he wants to reach, right? So you think, oh, I'm a great emperor. I'm so smart. I just conquered all these countries and I'm, I'm the best. Well, no, actually, God is enabling you to conquer these countries because God is using you as a puppet to reach a particular goal or goals. So there is, a, there is a direction in history and God gives power to certain people because he wants to go in a particular direction. God wants to go in a particular direction. So he gives power to these people who will take the ship of humanity into the direction that he wants to take it into. So that's, that's number one. In addition, you're going to be not just controlling humanity. You will have control over the different layers of nature. You will be able to control all the human beings. But you will also be able to control the animals in the jungle. You will be able to control the birds in the, um, in the heaven. God is giving you all this power. And you will have full dominion. You know who the golden head is? And that idol? You, Mr. Nebuchadnezzar. You are the gold head, right? Because gold is the most valuable, he's the most powerful, and the reason he's the gold is because he's in a special position in history. He's the one who's going to bridge the landmass, conquer Israel, and con unite those two um, uh, uh, land masses. Uh, by the way, just so you know, just today, today, right, there is, um, there's a, a professor in Israel, name is uh, Pasig, professor Pasig, I forget his first name, I think it's David Pasig. David, right, mm -hmm. right. Can't say about and, what? Can't say. Right. Can't so I read his book back in the year, I think 2006, I don't remember. And in the book in, that he wrote in the year 2006, he says that um, World War III will unfold in uh, a war between Ukraine and Russia. And he explains why Ukraine and Russia will go to war. And basically, I mean, this was written, in, I guess, about 15 years ago, right? So when the, when the war with Ukraine and Russia took place, I was like, wow, this guy's very smart. Uh, he seems to know so, a thing or two about uh, um, human history going forward. And he said something very interesting. So we're talking about Israel being the bridge, and that's why emperors always want to conquer Israel, right? Because whoever conquers Israel controls these two land masses. He said something really interesting. He said, so you look at what's happening now in the world with uh, China, with Russia, um, kind of trying to get together, and then you have America on the other side. And there's going to be a push um, by, let's call it the uh, Russian, Chinese, Iranian alliance is going to be a push to try to go towards the West, towards Europe. And you know who he says is going to be the key country? The key country in this whole war? Israel. This is what David Pasik says. Israel. He says Israel is going to be the country that will be able to, so to speak, be a buffer between the warring powers. That's what he says. Again, I'm not, I'm not talking about the book Daniel now, although this has to do with what we're reading, right? But I'm telling you that this position of Israel in world history is not something in the far past. It's today, right? One of the reasons you have the Abraham Accords that were formulated during the days of Donald Trump 
is because the Western world is beginning to realize they need to work with Israel in order to stop this push by the Chinese, Russian, North Korean, Iranian alliance, which wants to destabilize the West. And Israel is going to be at the forefront of that battle. So says David Fatik, and I think he's a very intelligent person. I actually take what he says seriously. So he says, Abraham, of course, is a way to strengthen Israel and strengthen the, um, the alliances between Israel and the Arab world, at least some of the Arab world, because it's, it, there's a lot of crazies there also. Um, and, 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 and that's the position, the strategic position of Israel till today is there. It hasn't changed. Okay, so we see that he's called the head of gold. I just want to give you a little Babylonian history. Do you know how um, Nebuchadnezzar's reign was referred to by the Babylonian historians of his age? So he's the head of gold. So just take a guess. What was it called? The, the golden age. Exactly. And it was this golden age that transformed Babylonia into the greatest empire of its time. It was also known as the Neo-Babylonian Empire because there's the old Babylonian empire from the days of Hammurabi and the days of Ramadan Abinu, when you had the, you know, Abba Melachim against the Hamisha. That's a different empire, and, 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 and they, they, they were not able to conquer Egypt, right? They stopped at Israel. That's where Abraham Abinu stopped them, if you remember the, the war, right? This is the Neo-Babylonian Empire, which included, as I said, Israel and, and, and parts of the uh, world west of Israel. It was also called the Chaldean Empire, so you can check it out, Google it if you want, the Neo-Babylonian Empire, uh, the Chaldean Empire. And here's what I want to tell you. The Pasuk that we read before says that God is going to give you beauty. Vikare, vikare means beauty, right? I want to tell you that Babylonia, under Nebuchadnezzar, and by the way, just historically, so you know, this is Nebuchadnezzar the second. Again, I just want you to like, I know people like to check up things, and I want you to know what you're looking at in history. So the Nebuchadnezzar that we're talking about is called Nebuchadnezzar the second in the books of history. So Nebuchadnezzar the second, who created the Neo-Babylonian Empire, he turned Babylonia into one of the wonders of the world, right? He rebuilt the Etemenaki Zubirat, uh, which, as you, some of you may know, is the Migdal Babel, right? So he rebuilt the Migdal Babel. He also built this beautiful, um, it's called the Ishtar Gate. I'm just going to read to you about the Ishtar Gate because it, it is quite fascinating. And it, it's, it's a good description or, or explanation of what Daniel means when he said that you're going you're gonna to have beauty. So the Ishtar Gate was the eighth gate to the inner city of Babylon. It was constructed in the year 575 BCE by King Nebuchadnezzar II, that's our Nebuchadnezzar, on the north side of the city. It was part of a grand walled processional way leading into the city. The walls were finished in glazed bricks, mostly in blue. I saw some renderings. It's simply magnificent with animals and deities and low reliefs at intervals. Um, and so on and so forth. It was, it was a magnificent building. Another wonder of the world that Nebuchadnezzar built was the uh, Hanging Gardens of Babylon, a large series of terraces that rose around 75 feet high, covered with all sorts of trees, flowers, plants, uh, one of the wonders of the ancient world. So when Daniel says that God is not just going to give you power, he's going to give you beauty, there's a lot of truth to that. Sometimes you have crazy dictators like the North Korean uh, dictator, whatever his name is, I don't even know if it's chubby, fat, short guy, um, I forget his name. Um, so it's, it's not an appealing country. It's a very dreary, you know, dark country, right? Nebuchadnezzar's empire was beautiful. Okay? Let's continue. Uvotrach tekum, I'm sorry, uvaterach. Uvaterach tekum malku achorim. After you will come another kingdom. Aramina. And this kingdom is going to be less powerful than you. I'm going to explain in a moment what that means, less powerful. And that's why it starts as gold, but it turns into silver. By the way, how many gold, gold heads were there? One. How, many, how much silver was there? There was two arms of silver, remember? Two. Okay. Just wait. Umalku tenita'a, there will be a third kingdom, Ahori, Dine Hasha, that will come of uh, copper, Vitishlat, Bechola'a, and this third kingdom will rule in the entire world. So now I want to take you through this pasuk and, and parse it because you're going to see the detail in the description and how it matches the historical unfolding of that era. Okay, so first, we have the one head of gold, which is Nebuchadnezzar. We have the two arms of silver. Why two arms of silver? 
Okay, because after Nebuchadnezzar, he, he had an empire that lasted about 70 years. It was 45 years Nebuchadnezzar. Um, his son was Evin Merodach, uh, 23 years, and then his son was uh, uh, Belshazzar. That was like another two and a half years. So what are we up to? 70 years. So, okay, so after so we have the Babylonian Empire, 70 years, correct? That's it? What comes after that? Parasu Madai, Megillat Esther. Right? I mean, it wasn't Hashverosh yet, but the Malkut HaHashverosh was Parasu Madai. How many kingdoms do you have in Parasu Madai? Two. It's the Persian Median Empire. There was an alliance between the Persians and the Medians. The Medians were this group of um, people. They were um, in the western part of Iran, right? So they were in the western part of Iran. They got together with the Persians, and together they defeated the Babylonians. So that's the two arms. You need two. It's a double. That's why you have two. You understand the idea? So, um, at, but notice he says, look at the pasuk again. After you, there will come another kingdom, Aramimach, less powerful than you. They're less powerful because the difference between the dictator, tyrant, and the rest of the people becomes less and less and less, right? So Nebuchadnezzar had absolute power. The power was centralized. And the power becomes more decentralized and more decentralized. That's why the, the, the gold becomes silver, the silver becomes copper, the copper becomes uh, iron, and then eventually uh, clay. So that's, that's important to understand. But also, look what he says about the third kingdom. I'm going to read it again. There will be a third kingdom, meaning after the Persian media, there will be a third kingdom. This third kingdom will rule the entire world. Why doesn't it say that about the Persian Medians? Right? No. It just says the Persian Median Empire will be less than you. It doesn't say they will rule the entire world. But then there will come a third kingdom that will rule the entire world. And the reason is as follows. If you look at the map, so Nebuchadnezzar, he, 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 as I said, he conquered Israel, conquered North Africa, and, and down to Ethiopia. Comes Parasumadai. They expand the empire. They get parts of, or some of the Greek city states. Yeah, did anybody here see the movie? What was it called uh, with the Spartans? Three hundred? Is that the four hundred? Three hundred. Does anybody know the correct number? Three hundred. I didn't see the movie. There was a 1962 version of the movie. So that movie is actually a movie describing the king of Hashverosh. Because if you look at Megillat Esther, it says that the king of Hashverosh reached the, king, the Greek island, right? So that movie is describing how he wanted to defeat the, Pro, uh, no, the Spartans, I'm sorry. He wanted to defeat Sparta and he couldn't. He couldn't reach the Spartans. They had a, a, a tremendous battle against them and they were able to keep them at bay. But he conquered parts of Greece. Okay. The greatest expanse is when Alexander the Great comes. That's the third empire. The Greeks, Alexander the Great, he was actually Macedonian, okay? He expands the empire because now he controls all of Greece, which the Persians didn't control, and that's why it says this empire will control the entire world, will have human civilization, and the sense that it will reach the maximum extent. <coughs> So under Alexander the Great, he starts at a point which is westward of where the Persians reach. That's where the Persians reach up to here, and Alexander the Great starts here, and then he conquers everything all the way to India. So you see again the precision of the dream and the precision of the Pesukim. Every single word is rich with meaning. The details are so important. So I wanted to explain that to you. So Alexander the Great, of course, was uh, the Macedonian. And it says, Malchu Achori. And also there, there is a duality. Because we know that there's two legs. And the two legs, uh, the top part of the legs, is um, uh, copper. Why two? There was this duality. On the one hand, Alexander the Great was a Macedonian. The Macedonians had their own language. They were a distinct nation. They were separate from the ancient Greeks. But they were part of the Greek Empire. So you see, again, this duality in the... Um, in the empire, right? It's Macedonian, it's Greek, right? So that's why we have, again, the two legs to symbolize the duality of this particular third kingdom. Um, 
uh, which was conquered by Alexander the Great. So that's, uh, that's that. And by the way, the book is going to go into even as, as great as the details are that we've seen until now, the book will go into even greater detail later on. This is just the beginning. It's like giving us like, you know, the rough edges of history. It'll go into like incredible details. But wait, that's in the future classes. Um, okay. A pasuk 40. By the way, are there any questions? Uh, last time I was told that I didn't give anybody the chance to ask questions. So I'm going to give only now the opportunity to ask questions if anybody has. And after that, we will uh, hopefully go forward. Yes, sir. And it gives me a chance to drink and rest my voice. Goal, you didn't say what the goal was. Hmm? Why he revealed to him the secret. Why he, uh, why he uh, married her to hear the, uh, you know, the end. In my opinion, to promote Daniel. This is incredible. Daniel comes, and Daniel now becomes Nebuchadnezzar's spokesperson to God. Okay, just think of that for a second. Nebuchadnezzar was probably the, one of the most powerful men that ever lived, because he had that centralized power that few, few have. And here is this Jew who is uh, telling him, God just spoke to you, and I know that I, I'll prove to you that God spoke to you, because I'm going to tell you what the dream was. God is going to tell me the dream that he put in your mind. Uh, wait till we see the end of this chapter on Nebuchadnezzar reacts. So what happens? So Daniel now is promoted in the kingdom. When Nebuchadnezzar goes to Jerusalem, he destroys the Beth Magdash, he exiles the Jewish people from Yerushalayim, from Judea, he takes them to Babel. Who's a strong person in the government? Looking out and making sure that the Jews who are coming now from Israel are comfortable. Daniel. That's the reason. Well, any other questions? Okay. Umalchu Rebi'a'a. And finally, there will come the fourth and final kingdom. This kingdom will be strong like iron, hard like iron. The same way iron can be used to smash and destroy everything. These people will be like iron. They will smash. They will destroy. This is referring to the fourth empire. So we started with the Babylonians. We went to the uh, Persian Medians. We went to the Greeks. And finally, who did we get to? The Romans. The Romans were indeed the most brutal. And the Nazis, the Machshemam, they used to imitate the Romans, right? They, 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 the Romans were like their role models, you know, how to be brutal, how to be ruthless, right? The things that the Romans did were simply uh, unspeakable. I mean, the brutality of the Romans was, was incredible. You know, what they did to the, uh, the Atalah, but it wasn't just them. I mean, any place they went to, they just massacred entire, uh, entire cities in, in, the, in the most horrible way. So this is the fourth kingdom. Um, uh, this... Uh, this, this is why it's called Barzel, because it, it just it was a very destructive um, empire. And we know what, what happened. The Romans, when they finally came into Yerushalayim, they destroyed the Beth HaMikdash, of course, and, and then it was um, the Bar Kokhba revolution. They killed uh, 90%, massacred 90% of the Jewish population in Judea. That's an incredible number. I mean, if you think about it, I think even the American Indians, did, did, the, um, did the Americans massacre 90% of the American Indians? I don't think it reached that level. I'm not sure. Um, but certainly brutality of Rome was uh, unprecedented right, in history. Um, so, And you saw that there, the, there was the, the lower part of the legs, right? And the, and the toes. You saw that some of them were still, I'm sorry, um, iron, and some of them were clay. So you see there's a split. This is going to be a split kingdom. Part of it is going to be strong and powerful like iron. But you're going to see that there's going to be a tendency to mix in the iron with the clay. With clay um, so what is that about? Um, what is this split? 
Does anybody know Roman history? Does anybody know what happened with Rome? So you know that the Roman Empire became very, very large and uh, the territory was vast and there was different tribes moving into Roman lands um, and the, the leadership in Rome was becoming weak, politically unstable, they were corrupt. They were just lawless, like you know, many of the politicians we have today, not a secret. And people were invading the empire from different sides um, and, and they weren't doing anything about it. The, the government in Rome wasn't doing anything about it, including the barbarian tribes who were, by the way, Rome didn't just fall. Everybody talks about the fall, the downfall of Rome. Rome didn't fall just in one day. You know, it was a very long uh, <laughs> series of events. Um, just think of that for a second and let's go back to the book. In the year 286, uh, the emperor Diocletian decided to divide Rome into two parts because he realized it can't be, it was just too big for one emperor to, uh, to rule. So he split it into two parts. He had Europe, let's say, was the eastern part, uh, the western part of the Roman Empire with Rome as the capital. And then you had the western part, Byzantium was the capital. Byzantium is what later on becomes Istanbul. So they split the Roman Empire exactly what it says here, Malchu Feliga Teheve. This is going to be a split empire where there is going to be iron, which represents the strong part of the empire, and clay. Hasatina is a very particular type of clay which represents the weak part of the empire. And do you know what happened eventually with the split empire? So we said there was the uh, Western part, right? The Western Roman Empire with, with, with Rome as the capital, right? Uh, it lasted, I think, about 100 years. Right? It was just the barbarians came in and uh, the politicians, again, were corrupt and it was, it was just a dying beast and little by little, it, was, it just uh, disappeared, right? And, and, and the barbarians came in, the Vandals came in, the Visigoths came in, right? Uh, it was the, actually, um, the Eastern Roman Empire, it lasted many years, centuries actually, right? A remarkable description, right? Again, split, part of that split will be very weak, the other part will be powerful, that, well, that's what happened to Rome, right? Um, so, and eventually, you know what happened to the uh, Eastern part of the Roman Empire? I mean, it was originally Byzantium and then Ottoman Turks took over and it became the Ottoman Empire. So there was a transformation. Whatever was left of the Roman Empire, the eastern part of the Roman Empire, uh, the Muslim Caliphate took over, and then it was transformed into the Ottoman Empire. And then the, the Western portion just, like I said, disintegrated. There was nothing left. Um, it was like dust in the wind, literally like the, uh, <laughs> the description. So um, let's read a little more. The Espeat Raglaya, Minehem Parzel, Minehem Hasaf, Min Kesat. Um, and and as, as you saw, the fingers, the toes, um, some were iron, some were um, uh, clay, because as, as noted, part of the empire will be powerful, the other part will be like fragile, like clay. It will be very easy to break. And then you looked and you saw there was this attempt to mix the clay with the iron. That's at a latter stage, right? So at a latter stage, as he's looking at the statue and he sees the continuation, because it's dynamic vision, it's not a static vision, it's not a painting. Remember, the statue was almost alive, right? It was shining at him. So there is this attempt to mix the iron with the clay. There is going to be an attempt, and I'm going to explain what that is, to mix different types of people. And it will not be possible to uh, mix them. They're going to try, but it's not going to be possible. The same way you can't mix iron with, um, with uh, clay, you're not going to be able to mix these people together. I just want to read to you because we're getting close to the end, and I just want to make sure that we get here so next week we can uh, continue. So last week's parasha, you remember what happened at the end of the parasha when Esav realizes that Yaakov Abinu was going to Padan Aram to find a good wife, remember? So what does Esav do? The Pasuk says, so Esav now is jealous, the Pasuk says, Vayav Esav, Yiberach Yitzchak et Yaakov v'shilach oto Padan Aram. Esav sees that the father, Yitzchak, sent Yaakov to Padan Aram, l'akahat lo misham isha, to find a wife. So what does Esav do? This is two Pesukim, the, the, the sub-ultimate verse of the Perasha. Now, Esav understands that his wives, who were chitiot, he understood that his parents don't approve of those wives. He saw that his father does not approve. He goes to Israel. I'm sorry? He goes to Israel. Yeah. For what? 
וילך עשו אל ישמעאל. So עשו goes to his uncle, ישמעאל. ויקח את מחלתו את ישמעאל, and now he goes to marry the daughter of his uncle, בן אברהם, who's the granddaughter of Abraham Avinu, אחות נביות אנשיו לא לאישה. So he decides to marry that woman. The פשט of the פסוק is, you know, somehow appease his parents. What are his parents going to say? That Ishmael is a Canaanite, but Ishmael is not a Canaanite. He's the son of Abraham Avinu, right? So there's kind of, you know, that, uh, that aspect going on. I, I once read a Midrash, and I think that Midrash, a Midrash on this particular Pasuk, and that Midrash explains what's happening here. We know that the uh, eastern part of the Roman Empire eventually becomes the Ottoman Empire, the Muslim Caliphate. We know the western part stays European, and eventually Europe is a further emanation of the Roman Empire is just split up with decentralized power. There's this tendency um, over the last few decades to create a unified power again, right? So they have the European Union. So that's the attempt to reunify the Western world, what was originally the Roman Empire or the Western part of the Roman Empire. So they have the European um, Union. By the way, the symbol of the European Union, oddly enough, is Migdal Babel, which I think is kind of fascinating. It tells you the psychology of these people, what they have in mind. They're not good people. They're bad people. say that very clearly. They're bad people. They manipulate us. They manipulate us into believing particular things. And then they use our weakness and our fears against us. But that's um, a subject for another class. What's happening here? There's a Midrash that says that Esav realized that Yaakov is going to get Eretz Yisrael. And he said, listen, I'm from Abraham Avinu. Right? My father is Yitzchak. My grandfather is Abraham. I'm the grandson. Yishmael is a separate branch of Abraham Avinu. Let me marry the daughter of Yishmael and the Zechut that we have together. I'm from Yitzchak. My wife is from um, Yishmael. The two children of Abraham unified in one person. In my children. That's what Esau thought. And what is Esau thinking? I'm going to get Eres Yisrael. That's what the Midrash says. That's what's happening here. Uh, it was the Mabit. Tzvi Moshe Dikrani from the days of Marana Kadosh says, you know what it means? That there's going to be a point where they're going to try to mix the iron with the clay. He's going to say in the future. He wasn't talking about his days because his days, this, none of this happened. But he says one day in the future. The Mabit was in the uh, 16th century, right? So in the 16th century, he says one day in the future, there was going to be an attempt for the for the Muslim world, Ishmael, and what I just read, to get together with Esau, with the Roman world, they're going to try to unify themselves as a way to attack the Jewish people. They're going to try to get, create this bond, Muslims, Europeans, right, Arabs, Europeans, will create this bond, and together we will be able to defeat Am Israel. we will be able to defeat the Jewish people, the land of Israel, That's how the Mabit explains this. That's the correct explanation. That's exactly what Daniel is telling Nebuchadnezzar. But what's going to happen with that attempt? It's not going to work. <laughs> Because they're eth ethnically different. They're too different. The Muslims are very different. The Arabs, I, say, I should say Arabs, are very different than um, Esau. It's two different cultures, different languages, different attitudes. So this attempt to get together to make a bond against Am Yisrael, against the Jewish people, is going to fail. And in the days of when, when all this is happening, when the Muslims are trying to get together with the, um, with, with the Western world, is trying to get together, so to speak, the Ottoman Empire representing the Muslim Caliphate is going to try to get together with the European powers. In those days, Yekim Ela Shemayam al Almin, God will create a new kingdom. And this new kingdom will be an eternal kingdom. You, Nebuchadnezzar, were thinking, am I going to be the eternal emperor? No, you're not. <laughs> It's going to be a whole series of empires after you. But there will be an eternal kingdom. And that's going to happen in Aharit Hayamim. And when that happens, when this eternal kingdom rises up, the Mashiach, that's it. There will be no other kings, no other emperors, no other tyrants um, replacing the kingdom of the Mashiach because the kingdom of the Mashiach will be eternal. Tzaddik 
Vetaser kol ilem ha-chevata vehi tekum le-almaya. And when this happens, the Mashiach's um, kingdom will be so successful and it will transform humanity that all the other kingdoms will be crushed and wiped out, wiped out. And the kingdom of the Mashiach, representing Am Yisrael, representing the wisdom of God, will take over humanity, not through swords, not through um, weapons, but through intelligence, through brilliance, through beauty. And you just saw the entire series of events in your dream representing the thousands of years of history told the Yemot HaMashiach, you should know that the God in heaven has revealed to you this secret and you should be sure that this is what will happen. That's it. Daniel finished. And Nebuchadnezzar didn't interrupt him once. Let me read to you the end of the chapter. I have another minute or two. I'm just uh, verse 46. Bedain Malka Nebuchadnezzar Nepal Alan Poy. You can't he's he, he he's in shock. He begins to fall down upon his face with Daniel Sagid, and he begins to literally pay homage to Daniel as one would pay homage to an idol. And he instructed his priests to immediately bring different types of incense and sweet-smelling um, 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 fires in his honor, as, again, as he would do to an idol. Daniel it is clear to me, it is absolutely true, that your God is the true God over all other gods. Your God is the ruler over the kings. Your God reveals the secrets. No, there's no way anybody could ever reveal the secret, what was going on in my mind. You did it. Immediately, Daniel becomes promoted. And he gets many, many gifts from the kings. He becomes powerful. He becomes rich. He becomes a man of prominence. He becomes essentially the prime minister of Babel, similar to the viceroy of Babel, similar to what happened to Yosef. You mentioned Yosef as Sadiq. A lot of similarities between Yosef and, um, and Daniel. And he became the supreme intellectual in Babel, all the other intellectuals were now under Daniel. Daniel just uh, finished the chapter, there's a lot to say about all these things, literally about 45 minutes additional, but I, obviously we, we want to go to the next thing. Daniel asked the, question, uh, the, the king for permission that he appoints his three friends. You remember Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah? His partners who didn't want to eat non-kosher food. So Daniel tells the king, can you please promote them to positions of power in the uh, chamber of the king? And they were, they were all appointed as ministers of uh, the Babylonian Empire. And so uh, finishes this story. The next chapter we are going to read. What to do with the dream? Nebuchadnezzar is the emperor, and he understands that God is like playing games with him. What can I do with this dream? How can I react to God playing these, you know, entering my mind, giving me this dream? He's telling me what's going to happen. There has to be a solution. The solution will be a Freudian solution. Sigmund Freud would have loved this, assuming I, I maybe even read it. It's Freudian. It's amazing. That will be in next week's class. We have a, is the place available? All right, so next week we'll be here, I believe. So uh, just keep keep uh, your WhatsApps open and you'll see where the class is.